I'm James Wong. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my aim tonight is to introduce you to Yi Dai Yi Lu, One Belt, One Road, sometimes called, because the Chinese and English translation is not perfect, sometimes called the Belt and Road Initiative, sometimes you hear it referred to just Belt and Road. My aim tonight is, uh, thanks to the conflicts originating in the Middle East, we in the West are living in an increasingly fractured and isolationist world, from Brexit to the Muslim ban, and the increasing likelihood of the breakup of the EU. We are apparently reaching peak globalization. Tonight, I'm going to make the case that globalization is not over. Rather, it is shifting from the US and to China. That instead of the Pacific century, this generation is going to witness the Silk Road century. That Yi Dai Yi Lu initiative is going to be the biggest driver of global economic growth in our lifetime. James Wong, class of 84 economics, um, also pretended at one point wanted to be an actor when I was in college. Okay. Um, by the way, just a shout out. Uh, the guy sitting next to me over there, just so I'm not alone in this, is, uh, became my brother-in-law. He sitting over there however long. <laughs> uh, so why am I giving this speech? Uh, there are many more qualified people in this room than me to give a speech beginning with my friend David Tang over there, a super prominent lawyer in the US and in Hong Kong. Um, we're, you just mentioned, you just heard me mention the Silk Road. Um, Peter Chen, who's in here somewhere, he's actually a silk trader. Okay, both of these gentlemen can probably give this talk in their, you know, while they're asleep standing on their heads. But let me give you my qualifications and why I think I can offer you a unique perspective. Let's begin. I have two reasons that I think I can give this talk. The first is my job. My company specializes in representing American companies who want to sell high-tech equipment into China. So if you want to sell a radar to an airport, if you want to sell a facial recognition system to a subway system, you talk to us. And that's when we sign some contracts. Because of my job, I have the privilege of access to both the deep state inside the United States as well as the deep state in China. And I get to talk to people who are really deep. <laughs> the second reason is because of my role, as you've heard, in the political consultative committee of Jiangsu province. Now, the political consultative committee is a uh, legislative body which is meant to uh, consult and advise the National People's Congress. Um, it's a family role, funnily enough. It's a family position that I stand in. Uh, I'm not on the national level, but Jiangsu province, which I represent, uh, is the wealthiest province in China, uh, GDP-wise. So because of this role, we also get to see a lot of the politics and the policies inside China. And because of both my official role and my job, uh, I am lucky enough to be able to see China from the inside. As an American, no less. I'm not Chinese. I'm an American. Um, and what I can offer you is context. Context. I can see things China's way. And by the end of this evening, I hope that you can also begin to see China's way. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to change your perspective. Um, why am I asking you to change your perspective? Just by being here, I know that you are cosmopolitan internationalists, all of you, right? You make up your own mind. You don't buy whatever just American TV media is trying to sell you, right? Tonight is one of those occasions where I'm going to ask you to think differently. Let's begin with, sorry, let's begin with just two very, very quick exercises 
If I ask you to think about China, and I have some MBA students in here, let's just focus on those MBA guys for a minute. If I ask you to think about China, okay, words that pop into your head, images that pop into your head, what have you got? You want to, somebody want to help me out here? Panda. And that's good. Who else? <laughs> Great wall, maybe? Yeah? People. People, okay. So this sort of stuff, right? Yeah, kings, yeah, right. Um, armies, dim sum maybe, dim sum maybe, right. Dragons, boats, all right. But here's the thing: if I ask a China person what they thought about China, okay, this is what they come up with: something completely different. Jack Ma, they want to talk about their gleaming cities. They want to talk about their high-speed trains, the stable government the food they have, they may want to talk about Hong Kong a little bit. They want to talk about the robots in their factories, and okay, they want to talk about pandas too. <laughs> right. So, a second perspective. If I was to ask you to, right now, describe US-China relations, what would you think? You would probably say, well, we have tension in the South Seas. We have a problem with trade. There's probably a currency war going on. Okay, China and U.S. is staring down a new Cold War. Okay, that's the U.S.-China perspective. But here's the thing again: if you ask a China person what they think about the China-U.S. relationship, completely different. When I was appointed to the CPPCC, um, I was. Uh, I had to go to a briefing. It was a 10-day seminar in Beijing. I sat in a classroom with 35 other uh, sort of newly minted delegates. Um, and we were given an education by uh, the university, uh, Beijing University, uh, by Tsinghua University, all the professors who would instruct what I would call as the equivalent of the undersecretary level at the, uh, in the US federal government. So we got to hear Chinese politics and Chinese policy as they want you to know, okay? As every official in China knows it. And it was, as an American again, completely eye-opening, very eye-opening. Um, you know, I don't have time to cover all of it, but at one, one of the sections was a half-day section about international policies. We got one Tsinghua University professor in there talking about it as well as one general. I mean, literally stars on, you know, general come in to talk us about it. And here's the thing. They do not see the United States as an adversary at all. China sees the United States as a benefactor. They love the United States. I mean, that permeated all 10 days that I was there. China loves the United States. They will, the word specifically the general used is that we are forever grateful. They were grateful to the United States for helping them expel the invaders in the Second World War. They're grateful for the United States for opening up trade. They're grateful for the United States for helping them get into the WTO. China is forever grateful. If you ask China, there is no Cold War going on, okay? So wait a minute, you go, take a step back. James, you're talking about alternative facts here. <laughs> Are you ignoring the South Seas? Are you ignoring the trade rules? Okay, actually China is not. Here is China's perspective. The United States and China are siblings. This is sibling rivalry, okay? The United States is the older brother, and you know, I have a sister, I know. We don't agree on everything. And sometimes we even fight. All of those who have siblings, think about it. Do you get along with your sibling all the time on everything? No, right? So from the Chinese point of view, there is no Cold War, and there never will be. Because China, as the younger sibling, will always accede to the wishes of the older sibling. Okay, I'm gonna to try to tell you some more about that later. So now that I've set the table, now that I've set the table, let me begin telling about what Mel went right. It all started with this, the TPP. The Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement began in 2008 
as, and China was really excited about this, they thought the TPP was envisioned as the first step toward a free trade agreement around the Pacific Rim. And China was all over this. They like, this is great. Okay, we finally get to have free trade with our older brother. All right? Unfortunately, when 2009 rolled around and the TPP was actually signed, China was not part of it. Okay? Hurt? Yes. Bad feelings? Actually, no. So, the reaction you would think is that China would lash back, right? This terrible, monolithic, communist government would lash back at the U.S. for this. That's not what happened, okay? In China, they were a little bit saddened, but what they thought was that Japan was the culprit. That that terrible Abe, right? He hits on things like human rights and democracy, intellectual property, those things that President Obama is most susceptible to, use those things to twist Mr. Obama from involving China in the TPP. They did not blame the United States, they blamed Japan. That's the Chinese perspective. Okay, and what made it so galling was if you remember in 2008, 2009, anybody remember back that far what was happening in America at that point? We were going through the Great Recession. The United States was printing money like crazy. They were selling bonds. And the largest buyer of bonds between 2007 and 2010 was China. Okay? So here's China basically funding America out of its Great Recession. And there's the president telling, America, telling China, well, you know, here's your human rights, and here's your politics, and here's your nuclear proliferation. But guess what? China says, that's fine. We'll still keep doing it because the older brother needs our help, okay? So what happens when your older brother and you don't get along, right? So if you're Seth Curry, you head off to Dallas. That's right, right, Dallas, not Houston. Anyway, so you head off, right? That's okay. I still wanna be part of the family. I don't, this is not a deal breaker for us. I'll just go and do my own thing. So China, because of the TPP, looked over here. Instead of looking at the Pacific, they turned their gaze over to the west, over the Teplamakan Desert, over the Himalaya Mountains, towards Transoceania, and then they remembered something. We used to have something called the Trade Road, Silk Road. In fact, the Silk Road was so important that at one point in time, it was the main economic engine for the world. Wow, whatever happened to the Silk Road? So a little history. Silk Road was a network of trade routes formally established by an imperial envoy, Zhang Qin, during the Han Dynasty about 2,200 years ago. There was actually a person that went out there and actually started trading. This road originated from Chang'an, which is now Xi'an, in the east, and ended up in the Mediterranean Roman Empire in the west. One of the major trade products was silk. So, a German geographer, that Ferdinand von Richthofen, and more about him in a second, um, coined it the Silk Road in 1877, and that was such a perfect name that it stuck. Even in Chinese, it's called the Silk Road. But it was not just one road, but rather a series of major trade routes that had helped build trade and culture between China, India, Persia, Arabia, Greece, Rome, and other Mediterranean countries. Just a quick side about Ferdinand von Richthofen. Uh, first of all, his connection to the United States is that he was a geographer, so he liked to explore. There's a mountain in Colorado called the Von Richthofen Mountain. It's named after him. And if that name rings a bell to any history buff over here, yes, he was the uncle to Manfred Von Richthofen, the Red Baron. It's a side note. Anyway, um, I was an economics major, but I should have been a history major. Um, anyway, the amount of traffic varied during the almost 
1,600 years of the road's existence. Scholars estimate that it accounted for up to 65% of the world's population and 80% of the world's GDP at its height. It reached its height during the Tang Dynasty, which is about 900, 600 to 900 AD, but declined after the Mongol Empire fractured the political powers that lined the road. The Silk Road ceased permanently after the fall of Byzantium, when the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople, and therefore shut off the West from the East, forcing the West to seek a maritime road and moving trade from that point onwards onto the sea, which is where we are today. Another way to look at this, remember we're talking about perspective here, another way to look at this is that beginning in 1453, the richest economic road in the world over Central Asia suddenly turned into a flyover problem. So, in 2013, China's president, Xi Jinping, proposed establishing a modern equivalent of the Silk Road, creating a network of railways, roads, pipelines, and utility grids that would link China and Central Asia, West Asia, and parts of South Asia. The State Council in 2015, it took them two years to put this plan together, but in 2015, the State Council authorized the One Belt, One Road Action Plan with two main components, the Silk Road Economic Belt as well as the 21st century Maritime Silk Road. The Silk Road Economic Belt is envisioned as three routes connecting China to Europe. You can see it through Central Asia, through South Asia, as well as through the Middle East. The Maritime Silk Road is meant to connect all the regional waterways between China and Europe. After the announcement, more than 60 countries with a combined GDP of 21 trillion have expressed interest in participating in the One Belt, One Road Action Plan. The initiative covers, but is not limited to, the area of the ancient Silk Road. The first 65 countries have been selected based on a list compiled by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, but at least propaganda says all countries are welcome. When complete, One Belt, One Road will cover 63% of the world's population, over 35% of the world's merchandise trade, over 40% of the world's GDP. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a game changer. Trade patterns will change. Now think about this for a moment. If you want to trade with your partners, but your partners don't have the infrastructure to sustain trade, what do you do? There's an ancient Chinese saying that goes, to get rich, first build a road. So our engineer president is offering infrastructure to all of its neighbors along the new Silk Road. High-speed trains and nuclear power are China's new global industrial calling cards. Beijing is also promoting international cooperation in industrial production and equipment manufacturing, identifying 12 sectors. Steel, ferrous metal, building materials, railways, electricity generation, chemicals, textiles, automobiles, telecoms, engineering machinery, aerospace, shipping, and offshore engineering. These are all areas where China has a competitive advantage and where global demand is very strong. One Belt, One Road is more than just physical connections, however. It aims to create the world's largest platform for economic cooperation, including policy coordination, trade and financing collaboration, and social and cultural cooperation. This is the globalization of flyover Asia. This is going to be bigger than both NAFTA and the EU combined. 
OBORs, OBORs, three priorities are, number one, to boost infrastructure productivity among all the partners. Two, to accelerate industrial development, including supporting local government efforts to attract foreign companies and investment. And three, to improve social well-being through encouraging private sector involvement in construction, promoting integrated construction practices to reduce cost, as well as spread the use of provident funds. We're all business people here, right? How much is this going to cost? Estimates are all over the map, but the initial estimate is at least one trillion and up to two to three trillion per year, depending on how you count it. This initiative is gigantic. Uh, one trillion has already been pledged by China. And just to give you an idea of how much one trillion dollars is, if we were to take the World War II Marshall Plan, the US Marshall Plan, and scale it up to 2015 numbers, that number would be 130 billion. This is one trillion, 12 times more. So this is pretty big. One Belt Run Road is supported by three main institutions. The Silk Road Infrastructure Fund, which is entirely China owned and currently funded to about $50 billion. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is made up of a number of up to 21 different Asian countries, currently funded to about $100 billion. And then the New Development Bank, which is made up of the BRICS countries, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which is also funded up currently to about $100 billion. The um, Asian Development Bank, which is a bank started by China, is also involved, but not necessarily directed involved in the uh, OBOR initiative. The World Bank this year signed an agreement with the Asia Infrastructure Bank to provide funding. And IMF, which should have been doing this years ago, okay, is now kind of looking on from the outside looking in. The effort has already made some practical achievements. China has signed bilateral cooperation agreements related to the project with Hungary, Mongolia, Russia, Tajikistan, and Turkey. Remember, this only started in 2015. There are more than 900 projects in the pipeline with an investment value totaling $800 billion, mostly involving infrastructure, plus 29 rail lines to Europe, starting from 17 different Chinese cities. Chinese Ningbo Shipping Exchange is collaborating with the Baltic Exchange on a container index of rates between China and the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Um, those of you on the supply chain side know what that means. More than 200 enterprises have signed cooperation agreements for projects along the OBOR route. The initiative has already hugely boosted trade and development. Trade between China and the OBOR countries along land and sea-based routes exceeded one trillion US dollars in 2015. That's a quarter of all of China's trade. Those exports along the Belt and Road countries now exceed the exports to the US as well as to the EU. One Belt, One Road isn't about offloading surplus capacity uh, of commodities like steel and coal. I think the way that we should more think about this is that it's exporting excess capital into investing in productive infrastructure across the globe. It pays a heck of a lot more than the one and a quarter percent that the US bonds were paying. Of course, there's going to be risk. OBOR is not, I repeat, is not a foreign aid program. It is a commercial project that requires participating countries to make long-term commitments and coordinate investments. In addition to commercial risk, there is already some political upheavals and environmental opposition in different countries. 
Another broad risk is the perception among certain OBOR countries that China's economic power could one day dominate their economies and societies as they integrate. Instead of mutual benefit, they worry that economic expansion might be a disguise to either drive China's military or political interests or a way to basically dump commodities. To this end, China has been heavily promulgating the three no's to all its OBOR partners. China has pledged that there will be no political interference, that there is no expansion of whatever you consider a sphere of influence, and there will be no hegemony sought by China. In my view, one more thing, and this political stuff could probably be put to bed, is the formation of a joint economic decision-making organization or mechanism. I think that's in the cards, coming soon. Um, this organization should be spread among the OBOR economies to ensure an equitable sharing of responsibilities, risks, and rewards. By 2050, the Belt and Road region aims to contribute 80 80% of global GDP growth and advance 3 billion people into the middle class. I have this theory. Over the last 30 years, the, the, the phenomenal growth you saw in China is because of urbanization. In 1980, roughly the time Deng Xiaoping opened up capitalism in China, 80% of the population lived in the countryside. By 2015, 51% lived in the cities. The migration of that 31% of the people, almost 600 million people, resulted in cities needing factories, cities needing hospitals, cities needing schools, roads, shops, jobs. That entire movement urbanization is one of the big key drivers to what made Chinese economy really boom. And just as sort of a statistical underlying to my theory, the rate of urbanization from 2014 to 2016 has dropped below 2%, which incidentally, core, seems to match the drop in the Chinese economic growth rate as well. So what's in it for non-Chinese? Besides infrastructure investments, imports, high-speed rail, there are ancillary private sector investment opportunities in real estate, telecoms, e-commerce, finance, tourism, education, the creative industries, and green technologies. One Belt, Run Road is not a one-way street of China's outbound investments. There is also a huge export potential for Western products, technologies, and services to enter China and the OBOR economies. One final point. Do you remember when I asked you to look at things from China's perspective? Well, in America, in the America First World, our president is likely going to take China to the mat and ask for a new trade deal. You know what? I predict that China will capitulate, give Trump everything he wants. Trump is going to go back to America, he's going to do this, and that will be terrible for the United States. That will be the worst possible thing. Remember what I said about sibling rivalry? Hey, if Big Brother is beating on you, you just go and find a different basketball team to play for. Okay? China will turn its back on the Pacific and focus on OBOR, which does not include the United States. China has already substantially slowed its purchase of U.S. bonds. So instead of making America great again, our policies may end up giving China the impetus to make America irrelevant again. You should always end the talk on a high note, I'm told. So I thank you for two of this panda pictures. <laughs>